Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the launch event for the World Bank's Middle East and North Africa Economic Update. My name is Karen Young, and I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Middle East Institute and founder of its program on economics and energy, as well as a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. I'm delighted to serve as moderator for this event, which is co-hosted by the World Bank and the Middle East Institute. This event is being broadcast on World Bank Live and also on the MEI website. I'd like to welcome our viewers from around the world who are watching this live stream in Arabic, French, and English. I encourage all of you who are watching this meeting to participate in the conversation via the hashtag being used for the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings, which is hashtag Rethinking Development. To kick off this launch event, we will hear first from the World Bank's Chief Economist for the Middle East and North Africa region, Dr. Roberta Gaddy. Dr. Gaddy will share with us findings from the report, which is called Altered Destinies, the Long-Term Effects of Rising Prices and Food Insecurity in the Middle East and North Africa. Over to you, Dr. Gaddy. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. Let me uh, share the presentation. Um, and uh, JJ, if you can just confirm that you see now in uh, the slideshow um, modality, that would be helpful. I can confirm that. Perfect. Looks good. So here we are, Altered Destinies, uh, and the challenge of food insecurity in the Middle East and North Africa as the core topic that we decided to uh, focus on for the April 2023 update uh, of um, uh, the economies in MENA. This is a product of the MENA Chief Economist Office, and you see all the authors acknowledged here in this uh, page. Uh, as it is customary for this type of reports, you will see a first part, which focuses on the macroeconomic outlook, and a second part, which focuses on the spotlight theme, which is food insecurity, and which we believe is very timely for our region. So at the cost of spoiling the surprise, let me start with some of the key messages of the report. And I will begin with the macro story. And the macro story is one that uh, uh, sees a slowdown in main economic growth after the oil windfall of 2022. And so the region uh, that grew at 5.8% in 2022 um, is now forecast to grow at only 3% in 2023. And much of it is due to the change in, expect in growth expectations for uh, GCC, the Gulf Cooperation countries, which grew on average at 7.3% in 2022, but are expected to grow around 3.2% 3 in 2023. Now, a concern that has been on everybody's mind for 2022 has been inflation. And it's true that the region inflation rate rose dramatically in 2022, although in a previous report we showed that this inflation rate was lower than the counterfactual that it could have been thanks to various product market interventions. But here what we focused on is the fact that food inflation grows even faster. Just two numbers that I would like you to keep in mind. Food inflation year on year between March and December 2022 was 29%. Headline inflation year on year was 19%. Why should we worry about rising food prices, even if they are temporary, even if they taper uh, in the coming months? We should care about them because they pose severe challenges to the region that may last for generations. And what you will see in the report is thinking through the causal chain of how rising food prices can affect nutrition for children, uh, young children or in utero, what are the implications for their productivity as tutor workers, and what we will see also what are policies that can be uh, enacted to counteract these challenges. Now, these challenges compound an already inadequate situation of child nutrition and health pre-COVID in the region. And something that uh, you might expect to hear from me if you follow that all uh, our recent series of many economic update is a focus on data. And unfortunately, and as in other sector, even for child nutrition and health in MENA, we have dated data. And so policymakers and also economists are flying a little bit blind. 
Now, when we move from what has happened in the past to what we can forecast for 2023, the report has also uh, used new techniques such as machine learning to forecast uh, a measure of food insecurity for the region. And it turns out that food insecurity has deteriorated in the region, and probably unsurprisingly, but equally sadly, it is has the hot spots in Syria and Yemen. The conclusion that you see me bring into the conversation, at least the presentation of the report today, is that we need to act now because the cost of inaction uh, because of the repercussions through the productivity over a lifetime of children, but also repercussion over future generations can be much higher. So these are the key messages, but let me now start with the macro outlook for the region. What you see here on the left is how the MENA region depicted in dark red in panel A performed in terms of cumulative growth starting from 2021 vis-a-vis -vis the world. And so you see that the red line, the dark red line is much above the yellow line. And the steeper slope that you see between 21 and 2022 is indicative of that 5.8% that I was mentioning, which is higher than the average growth rate. And then you see that that line, sort of the slope of that line flattens out. And that indicates the sort of 3% forecast for next year and the sort of 3.2% forecast for 2024. On the um, right hand side panel on panel B, you see a tail of two manas. Uh, the, the growth spurt in uh, 2022 was really driven by GCC oil exporting economies. And you see uh, their growth trajectory depicted in dark brown at the top, very fast growth in 2022 and a slowdown in 2023. You see also in the lighter brown color at the bottom, the trajectory of oil importing countries, excluding Egypt. And you see at the end towards 2024, a sort of divarication, a divergence between this growth path in oil exporting economies and oil importing economies. Uh, the dashed line represents a little bit of an outlier, which is Egypt. Egypt grew very fast in 2022. Uh, its for growth forecast has, have been downgraded to 4% from 6.6% in 2022 for 2023 on the back of improved uh, uh, receipts from uh, tourism, the Suez Canal and construction. However, it's a country that presents uh, long-standing vulnerabilities. And when we look at the private sector forecast, we see that the range of forecasts is very wide for Egypt in 2022, anywhere between 2% and 4.5%. Now, I was talking about private sector forecast, and what you see here in this slide is exactly um, some sort of uh, manipulation or you know, algebraic uh, work on private sector forecasts, which are produced monthly. And we thought that this was interesting and useful because we could look at how the growth forecasts were updated every month starting with uh, February 2022, which was the time of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so what you see on the left hand side are the forecast upgrades or downgrades for 2022. And you see a sharp upgrade on the growth forecast for oil exporters and GCC immediately after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And you see a progressive downgrade of growth forecasts for oil importing countries uh, represented here in sort of light brown uh, continuously until about October 22 and then kind of plateauing uh, until February 23. Uh, what So what you see for 2022 is this divergence, this tale of two mena that I was referring to at the beginning. What you see for 2023 is a continuing tale of two menas, but at the lower levels of growth. So in February 2022, the forecast for 2023 were upgraded upwards for oil exported, but then things started tapering down and they progressively taper down for developing oil importers, which are uh, countries about which we are um, overall more concerned in terms of their macroeconomic outlook. Now, I told you a tale of two men as for growth, but I think that a tale of two men also applies for the question of inflation, which is one of the other big concerns that we have uh, about the region. Uh, 
when I was talking about growth, the dividing line were oil exporters versus oil importers. Here, the dividing line of these two menas are countries that are uh, in a fixed or conven conventional peg with the dollar or with a basket of currencies and countries that have had other forex uh, um, arrangements. So let me just go through this slide, which is probably the more complicated of the presentation, a uh, little by little. So what you see here is the average year-on-year -year inflation from, from the sort of post-pandemic until February 2022 in the region. You see quite a variation in uh, inflation levels, uh, including, and please note that uh, the Iran and Lebanon are set aside and their inflation rate is measured on the right-hand side um, axis because it's off the chart vis-a-vis -vis the inflation rates of other countries. So what happened post-February 2022? You see this uh, highlighted in yellow and with this horizontal line representing just by way of benchmark the U.S. year-on-year -year inflation. So inflation increased in 13 out of our 16 countries and increase proportionately more in this group of countries where you see other forex arrangements. So countries whose uh, currency were allowed to the value depreciate or move within some bands. Uh, since exchange rates seem to be so important in determining the inflation rate measured within a country, we calculate the counterfactual inflation rate that would have happened once we adjust by the uh, exchange rate movements. And what you see is almost by construction and definition, no change between the yellow bar and the blue bar in the first group of countries that have a conventional fixed peg because their currencies did not depreciate. But what you see on the right hand side in the group of countries of other forex uh, arrangement is that in a country like Egypt or the Palestinian territories, the exchange rate depreciation slash devaluation accounted for the bulk of local inflation. Um, so as we keep that information in mind, let's move now to food inflation, which is somehow the sort of core, the nexus of uh, our report and the one that uh, links in the macroeconomic part with our spotlight on food insecurity. So what you see in the second slide is uh, average food inflation before February 2022 in uh, dark red and average food inflation post-Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. And what you see is that food inflation has increased almost across the board with few, um, uh, just few exceptions. And it has increased proportionately more in countries with other foreign exchange arrangements. Some of these countries are large food importers and uh, the sort of flexibility or sort of ability to move their foreign exchange translated into much more costly uh, food items um, uh, internally. Now, to bring the two of you together, headline inflation and food inflation, we're going to the next graph. And what we see here is food inflation uh, represented on the, uh, the y-axis and headline inflation on the x-axis. And you see that with the exception of Jordan and Qatar, all of our countries had higher food inflation than entlad inflation, headline inflation. I just wanted to remind us that Egypt and Lebanon are essentially off the charts, and my hand is going like towards there up uh, to the right because their uh, food, their food and headline inflation were so high uh, and read on a different scale. Now, why this focus? on food inflation. Uh, let me give you two reasons, one which is immediate and one which is long-term. So we know that inflation is regressive and that inflation always ends up hurting the poor the most. What about food inflation? So high food inflation really meant that in the region, the poor were hit the hardest in the developing part of the region. So what we did here is that we took, the, we took a bunch of household surveys. We ordered the households by consumption per capita, uh, increasingly from the poorest to the richest. We grouped them into uh, quintiles and we looked at the share of that food occupies in their budget. And we know that the poor tend to consume more food out of the total of their budget. And through that, we calculated what is this sort of implied annual inflation per each group 
from the poorest to the richest. And what you see here for a group of developing MENA countries, which you see listed at the bottom, is that the food inflation perceived by the richest quintile, which is represented in yellow, is quite a bit lower than the food inflation perceived by the poorest quintile of the population in these countries, which is represented, and it's above by about two percentage points all along between March 22 and December 22, uh, and is depicted uh, in red. So one of the first big concerns about inflation and particularly food inflation is that there are redistributive uh, properties of inflation that hurt the poor the most. And this is something that really affects us here and now. But the second uh, element that we look at are the long-term consequences of food inflation. And uh, many of us are familiar with the vast literature that exists looking at the importance of prenatal and the first 1,000 years of life for the development of cognitive function, productivity, and even potentially the transmission of the uh, intergenerationally of these traits. So what we have done here is that we looked at one specific example of how food inflation can affect human capital. And let me just walk you through quickly through this example to give you a sense of what the impact of increased prices can have uh, on people. So we looked at uh, the exposure of food inflation in utero, and this is something related to the fetal hypothesis, fetal origin uh, hypothesis that basically indicates being in utero as being uh, in a crucial moment for the development of a child. So it turns out that there are existing estimates that shows that one percentage point higher month-to-month -month food inflation is associated with an increased risk of stunting for children. Stunting is a measure of height for age for children, which is taken at different stage of their life, but the typical measure that is used is under five, so for any child under five. Uh, the exposure of the children who were in utero in MENA between March and June 2022 translates into a total increment of the risk of stunting in MENA from a baseline of 16.2 by 17 to 24%. This is high. And in terms of number of newborns, it means an additional 200,000 to 285,000 children who are born with a clear risk of stunting. Now, should we just worry about uh, stunting, which means being short for your age? Actually, that measure is more than just being short for your age. It's a stock measure of the health of a child. And we know from the literature that it is associated with a lower performance in schooling in terms of both attainment and in this case, exposure to four months of increased inflation in MENA already translates, uh, is likely to translate in anywhere between three weeks to a month or lower average school attainment. And it also reflects into lower. Um, test scores. And here we find a drop of 0.5 to 0.8 percent uh, for uh, tests. Now, uh, these shocks, and we're talking about the shocks to food prices, overlay on a situation in MENA that was already somehow inadequate in terms of child health. So what you see here in this graph is the prevalence of stunting, which is plotted and is measured on the y-axis, vis-a-vis the log of GDP per capita, just a typical measure that we have of countries' well-being. You see the whole world, all the countries of the world plotted in gray, and in red you see MENA country highlighted. So a couple of uh, things to take from this graph. First of all, uh, you see the name of the country, well, the World Bank three-letter code with a date that is attached to that point. So we have survey data, which means directly measure uh, height for age for children uh, in Yemen in, only from 2013. And already in 2013, almost 50% of Yemeni children were stunted. In Libya, a country that uh, is quite well off, in 2014, almost 40% of children were measured to be stunted. And stunting was also high in a country like Syria, and the three of them are the ones who, after this survey measurement entered, protracted uh, times of uh, conflict or political disruption. So this is something that uh, is 
very likely to have deteriorated significantly in the past 10 years and something where we as policymakers and development practitioners should put a lot of attention, both in the terms of measurement, in terms of measurement, these data are old, they're 10, 15 years old, and in terms of policy action. The other part of this graph where I would like to focus your attention is also the country that you see at the sort of far right, the richer countries. Uh, in MENA, still highlighted in red and still above the fitted line, which means that these countries have higher stunting than their income, their level of income per capita would predict. Granted, in uh, Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Bahrain, we have data that is uh, quite old. And we know that stunting tends to improve with income and with time. But even in, country, even in countries like Oman and Kuwait, where we have more recent data, 2017 being quite recent, at least by MENA standards, we see that they are above the line and that they have level, level of stunted and overall health of children that could be improved significantly from where they are. Something that we also should remember, and this goes back to the distributional part of the story that for us in the World Bank is always an important concern that even within countries, we see differences in the level of stunting for the region. What you see on the left-hand side is the stunting for different wealth, different wealth quintiles of families. And in a country like Morocco, for example, you see that uh, the rate of stunting in the first quintile, so among the poorest families is above 20%, but the rate of stunting in the fifth quintile among the richest families is way below 10%. So this is cut in half and there are big within country differences. On panel B, you see the countries that have stunting sort of at levels of the charts, because you will note that the Y axis uh, has that goes all the way up to 60%, while the Y axis in panel A went up to only 35%. Let's just look at Yemen. In Yemen, in 2003, a family in the fifth quintile, a child born in a family in the fifth quintile, the richest quintile of the population, has a chance of being stunted, which is half that of a family being born in the poorest quintile, which is in the red um, uh, um, square represented above. So quite a bit of a different distribution across countries, a general underperformance vis-a-vis -vis the world, but also important differences within countries for the sort of situation where these new shocks have come by. A further piece of information that I wanted to bring you about the pre-pandemic story is that MENA is also a country that tends to underperform in terms of dietary diversity. Uh, and dietary diversity is fundamental for healthy growth of children. Why should we care about that now? Because food inflation can make certain nutritious foods less uh, affordable for families. And we are in a region that uses food subsidies quite uh, significantly, including during the post-pandemic period, uh, controlling the prices or subsidizing the prices of certain foods, not all of which ends up being the most nutrition. And what I'm hinting at here is not only stunting and malnutrition, but the double burden that is very typical of middle-income countries of having both children that are stunted, therefore uh, suffering from malnutrition in some form, and children that are obese. I need to be true to myself. I need to conclude the part of looking back in the situation of health of children in MENA by looking at how we measure it and how well we measure it. And unfortunately, the story in here, I will sound like a broken record in these presentations because in MENA, only 11 out of 19 countries have data, survey data, so directly measure data for health and nutrition of children uh, uh, after 2015. And just a reminder, we are in 2023 and many things have changed since, including the pandemic, protracted conflict, and uh, now this uh, shock that has come from the Russian invasion to Ukraine. Just as a comparator, a country like Mexico uh, has its uh, last directly measured survey for health and nutrition of children in 2022. Now, I looked at the past and I looked at the sort of causal channels through which uh, food inflation can affect uh, human capital, but let us 
look now at the present. And this is the part where we relied on a collaboration with our research uh, department here at the World Bank. And we had uh, a sort of uh, modeling and prediction forecasting of uh, severe food insecurity in, in the MENA region uh, using data from the FAO and using machine learning technique to predict this uh, data where data were not available. What comes out of this story about severe food insecurity and what you see here in the graph is the forecast for 2023. Well, a couple of uh, things to note. First of all, food insecurity in the developing part of MENA has deteriorated quite significantly in the past 20 years, going from 11.8% in 2006 to 17.6% in 2023. Unsurprisingly, but equally sadly, Syria and Yemen are the hotspots of this food uh, insecurity. And this is something, and these are, these are data and modelization pre the 2023 earthquake. So the situation might be even more uh, dire in, in Syria. Something else that we should note is that upper middle income economies, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon are significantly underperforming they are in peers. And you see in the difference between the top of the uh, dust blue uh, lines and the dashed line, which represent the benchmark prevalence for income for country in the same uh, income group. We also see that the high income countries are somehow underperforming vis-a-vis -vis their high income peers. And the one that is underperforming the most is uh, Oman and the, the, uh, one of the countries that should put uh, significant attention to child health and development. Now, if we talk about attention to child health and development, what can we do? So, first of all, we need to act now. And I hope that by highlighting and bringing to light the long-term consequences of food insecurity, I convinced you that the cost of food insecurity compound over time within the life of a person, but can also have a repercussion intergenerationally. Many things can be done. Uh, you know, cash and in-kind transfer can be the sort of first port of call to protect the most vulnerable. But in a uh, situation of tight fiscal space, which is definitely the case for oil importing countries, not the case for oil exporting countries necessarily, targeting of the poor can make this action the most affordable fiscally. We talked about the importance of uh, shocks while in utero. So you don't only want to protect the, the child, but you really want to protect the mother. And so the whole um, group of, the whole set of policies that protect expectant mothers, that allow them to take care of their children effectively, and that sort of continue to uh, invest on changing the norms about mother nutrition while, pre while expectant is very important. Of course, there are also longer term and supply side, we can define them policies that uh, can aim at building resilient food systems in a region like ours, which is uh, highly exposed to uh, things like droughts and sort of weather shocks, but also expanding the coverage. And some of our countries are doing that effectively, the coverage, the access, the affordability and reducing the fragmentation of healthcare. Uh, I want to conclude here on data and make sure that data are not an afterthought. If we fly in the dark without data, we are not able to assess the actual situation of child health and nutrition. We're not able to design uh, effective uh, uh, actions and we are not able to target them effectively so that the costs are contained. contained. So let me stop here and thank you for your attention and I look forward to the conversation that will follow. Thank you, Karen, Karen and over to you. Thank you, uh, Roberta Gatti, again, with her commitment to uh, to survey data and um, and tracking human capital in the region. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, let's have a bit now of a panel discussion. I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, all of their bios are on the World Bank Live page, so I'll keep the introductions brief. You can learn more about them online. But first, we'll go to uh, Mr. Farid Belhaj, who is uh, the World Bank's Vice President for the Middle East and North Africa. And second, we will hear from Dr. Mohammed Salaiman Al-Jasser, who is President and Chairman 
of the Islamic Development Bank Group. And the IDB was a partner um, in this report, which you can also see um, the full copy online. Third, we'll go to Dr. Paul Salem, who is president and CEO of the Middle East Institute. Um, and uh, Roberta Gatti uh, will be with us to handle other questions if we have any technical questions about uh, the report, and uh, we'll get more from her economist perspective. If it's all right, I'd like to go to um, uh, Mr. Belhaj first, and, and let's kind of point back to the World Bank and in, in your work on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what is or what can the World Bank do um, to address food insecurity across uh, the Middle East, North Africa right now. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen. And again, I'd like to uh, thank very much uh, His Excellency, the President of the Islamic Development Bank and Paul uh, for uh, engaging with us and hosting us. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the whole uh, World Bank team that, and uh, the Islamic Development Bank team who have worked uh, to make sure that this report uh, is, is issued on time and with the high quality that uh, we have been accustomed to. So thank you so very much for that. Uh, you, your, your question is, 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 is a broad one, and uh, I will answer uh, at two levels. First, in terms of you know uh, the overall approach that we have taken in the Middle East and North Africa uh, region as a way to engage strategically with our countries. We have adopted what I would call the two-pronged approach. We have, we are in a manner uh, engaged in a number of emergencies, food being one of them, but we have a number of others. But we also, at the same time, uh, engaged in medium and longer term reform uh, agendas. So yes, on February 25 of last year, uh, when uh, uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, we immediately, that day, you know, sounded the alarm bell when it, because we understood that what's going to happen is clearly um, uh, uh, will have a direct impact on, on our countries. And uh, we wanted to move fast, and we did move fast. We moved on a number of uh, uh, urgent uh, food security operations, whether it is in Lebanon, immediately, uh, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Djibouti, and we, you know, were ready, you know, ready and to, and to open it even more. What is interesting is that there was a lot of complementarity between us and the Islamic Development Bank, because then, and I'm sure that His Excellency would mention that, you know, uh, the Islamic Development Bank moved on a very uh, 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 sizable operation in Jordan as well. So it was a very, you know, well coordinated and broadly defined engagement, engaging immediately, immediately. But at the same time, because we are looking at more of a sustainability engagement on this particular issue, we have put together a number of operations that would, you know, uh, it, in a way, transform, you know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the way countries are managing their food security uh, agenda and their policies on that. So we engage in Jordan, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt and other places or in terms of putting together new policies for a new agricultural um, engagement and uh, basically to change the overall uh, uh, food system uh, you know, in, in a comprehensive way. We also have managed to engage with a, with a number of countries, again, uh, Egypt being one of them, uh, Lebanon being uh, uh, another one, to make sure that when we engage on this issue of uh, food security, we also you know, engage on the broader agenda that is water, uh, that is the agenda that has a lot to do with, you know, working on uh, 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 helping countries to get more fertilizers. And we have, you know, in the Middle East and North Africa, one of the, you know, largest fertilizers uh, company in the world, and that's the uh, uh, Moroccan uh, uh, official Richard de Phosphat, with whom we are working very, very closely. So we are engaging on that and making sure that, again, you know, we address the immediacy of the threat, the immediacy of the, of the constraint, and at the same time, we make sure that, you know, we are looking medium and uh, longer uh, term. Let me f finish with this on this particular issue, because uh, the issue of nutrition is an important one. And uh, with Roberta, 
a few years back, you know, we worked uh, uh, on the Human Capital Project that was launched during the annual meetings of the Bank and the Fund in Bali a few years back. And that is really important because through that operation, through that engagement, through that research, we were able to identify, you know, the, you know, how much uh, uh, a, a, a human brain, you know, uh, is affected by malnutrition. And we were able to put numbers behind it. We were able to put a, a face, a human face behind what malnutrition meant and what it means for the future of a child and what it means for the future of countries overall. So that, that also is a very important discussion to be had. And I'm sure that Roberta can elaborate more, more on it, but I would urge you to, if I may, go back a few years and take a look at the, uh, at, at, at the research that, was, that underpinned you know, that uh, human capital project, because it is really an eye opener and it really gives you a sense uh, of what it means to be hungry today for the future of nations. Well, at the time we called that the, you know, uh, the new wealth of nations. The new wealth of nations, in a way, is their human capital. And it is very important to keep that very much in mind. And again, I would, I would urge a, 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 another conversation about that particular agenda. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, Mr. Bahaj. And I think that's such an important linkage. What you're really pointing to are these connections, of course, between the food, the fertilizer, the energy security sort of nexus, and then the importance of tracking in terms of human capital over time. So um, really, really important um, work that is going on there. I'd like to move next to uh, Dr. Aljasser. Um, and, and Roberta talked a lot about in her presentation, the kind of divergence in terms of inflation impact across the region. If you might address the, uh, you know, the inflation rate in the Gulf has been relatively low. Um, and we know, of course, this has something to do with the uh, monetary policy and peg currencies. But could you highlight how these countries have managed to keep inflation more under control? <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you, Roberta, for that presentation, and thank you, uh, uh, World Bank uh, and uh, Paul, for uh, putting together this uh, uh, this panel discussion. Very timely. I think the uh, the GCC has been uh, blessed uh, in, in, in many ways. One of them is the consistency of policies. I think in terms of inflation, monetary policy as a signal, not just an act, but as a signal is a very important one. And take Saudi Arabia, for example, since 1986, since 1986, exchange rate has not changed at all. You will have people say, but, you know, things have changed and the exchange rate has to change with them and all of that. that. That's a big debate. But I think the markets and the consumers and the investors, they relied on that anchor and they did everything around it. And that has provided the stability in prices in the GCC that we have, uh, we have witnessed and we have enjoyed in the and uh, GCC. So I think in country commodity producers, we should never underestimate the importance of exchange rate stability. Uh, I would even claim that we should never underestimate the importance of uh, monetary stability for all economies, not just for uh, uh, commodity producers. And the numbers have shown that. Of course, that's not to say that macroeconomic policy, particularly fiscal policy and trade policy didn't pl play a role. It also played a role, and also that was predictable. Competition in, for example, the Saudi market, be it for food products or any other products, is very strong. So competition provides a shield uh, from the exorbitant prices that sometimes are not as, as a result of shortages as much as they are of manipulation. And as we learned in economics, prices are very flexible upward but very sticky downward. So if you do fiscal and trade policies in addition to the monetary policies and the exchange rate policies that will give 
uh, a predictable, stable outlook. That tends, and I think the GCC countries have shown the example, to keep prices way below what would be the case otherwise. And that's why you see, for example, if you take the MENA countries, uh, excluding the GCC, you will see that the uh, the, the price uh, rises are, are much higher than they are in the uh, GCC uh, countries. So, as I said, the trade policies also very severe competition uh, has been has been very instrumental in providing uh, the necessary supplies and shielding the domestic market from uh, the uh, the uh, ups and downs of the uh, uh, of the markets shielding and i don't mean that they don't get affected but the uh, the effect is much more moderated and much more mitigated than uh, the case would be of course the gcc again one of the other blessings is that food in the in the basket of consumption of the consumers is much smaller so the effect on food prices is much smaller. Uh, the effect of food prices on inflation is much smaller than in other countries, be it in the MENA or in, in, in uh, other countries. So that has also worked very well uh, in, in favor of the GCC. But to conclude, I think there has been uh, insufficient attention paid to the impact of predictable, stable anchor for monetary policy and exchange rate policy. And in economies that are still in a very development stage, that is very important. And if we need any evidence, we can just look at the GCC. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. al -Jassar. And that was a strong defense of, uh, of uh, um tight monetary policy and the PEG system. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'd like to go to uh, Paul Salem. Um, Paul, I, I know that MEI has done some interesting collaborative work with the Arab Barometer. Um, and I'd really like to hear your take more on sort of a view from the region. Um, you know, what do we hear from people inside the Middle East, North Africa about inflation and food inflation, food insecurity? Um, how is this sort of um, being expressed through um, public opinion survey? Thank you, Karen. Uh, it's lovely to be with uh, everybody on this panel and honored to work with the World Bank and the Islamic uh, Development Bank. And yeah, we have been collaborating with the uh, Arab Barometer Project, which is a uh, fantastic uh, public opinion survey project that's been going on for almost 15 years now. It's out of Princeton University. Uh, the research director there is uh, Selma Shami, and they recently put out a report about uh, public opinion relating to food insecurity. These are surveys that were done between 2021 and 2022, uh, so recently, but may not have taken into account all of the effects of the uh, uh, Russian war on Ukraine, but uh, at least some of them. Uh, the surveys were in 10 countries, uh, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Palestine, Sudan, and Tunisia. Uh, importantly, they were not uh, conducted uh, in Syria and Yemen, which, as we've seen from the World Bank report, are far and away uh, the countries with the most acute food insecurity. But even in the 10 countries that I mentioned, eight out of, uh, in eight out of 10 of those countries, uh, half or a majority of respondents said that uh, uh, they don't have the means to secure food to uh, last an entire month, that that is either sometimes the case or often the case. So that gives you an idea of how high in the minds of respondents, half or more than half, in Egypt it's almost 70%, where food insecurity is uh, the most acute concern and worry uh, of these uh, of these populations. That is definitely a stunning figure. Uh, uh, that figure uh, was already bad before the events uh, that began in 2020 with COVID uh, and then the developments of 2022 with the war in Europe 
and then inflation and all of the crises that came after that, let alone uh, the earthquakes, as mentioned, that impacted certainly Syria and neighboring uh, Turkey. In 2019, uh, the number of food insecure people was 55 million out of about 400 million in the Middle East and North Africa. That number clearly has gone up. So, uh, uh, you know, one sixth or one fifth of the population of the Middle East and North Africa is is food insecure. Uh, that, you know, that is a, a devastating uh, figure. Uh, obviously, much of this uh, reverts to governance issues that, uh, you know, we and others at the Middle East Institute and others uh, look at very closely. Uh, it's kind of staggering to think that almost uh, 75 years since the sort of Middle East state system took shape, that one of the primary functions of government uh, is uh, not to have high levels of hunger or food insecurity. Uh, and yet, uh, here we are in the third decade of 2023, and hunger and food insecurity is not getting better. It did not get better in the past decade between 2010 and 2019. It certainly got worse in the last uh, four or five years. And I think that is a uh, a very stunning, uh, you know, and, and sobering thought. Obviously, a lot of this uh, food insecurity uh, is high in conflict countries. Uh, Syria and Yemen is an obvious one, but also uh, you take countries like Libya and Iraq, uh, Lebanon to some degree being a semi-conflict country. So conflict and, uh, you know, state failure, partial state collapse uh, is is a big part of it. Uh, but you also see uh, significant differences on a gender basis uh, that women and obviously women uh, heads of household, but women in general are much more affected uh, by food insecurity uh, than men. Uh, we see a, a rural urban divide in the public opinion surveys that in the rural areas, in a sense, maybe surprisingly, you see more food insecurity than you do uh, in uh, urban areas. Obviously, uh, income is a divider. People with high income obviously have much less food insecurity. So it's really a, a stunning set of uh, of responses. Uh, the remedies for this, from public opinion, are not uh, you know not necessarily uh, clear. It's interesting that there still is a general preference in terms of governance for democracy uh, as a governance system, and you can certainly link issues of voice uh, and inclusion or the absence of voice and inclusion because generally poor people in these countries that are surveyed do not have a voice in policymaking, and those are the people that go hungry. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's something to look at, something to uh, consider. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Paul Salem, for, um, for those remarks and for bringing us back to you know, thinking about how people are describing their own situations. Um, right now in this difficult time. I'd like to go back to Dr. Gaddy. Um, Roberta, I mean, could you walk us through a little bit about, um, you know, the evidence behind this premise, this, you know, very stark premise of the report that food price inflation hurts children, but that the consequences are so enduring um, and that you can measure them. Even a short-term price shock um, in food can, you know, create these uh, these consequences in learning and in stunting. Um, so how, how do we know this? Can you walk us through that? Uh, please, Karen, and this is a question that is very, very close to my heart, having been one of the sort of co-creator of the Human Capital Index. But before I delve into that literature, I wanted to make a clarification about the report and one of the slides that you saw uh, on inflation, the one that sort of grouped countries in fixed exchange arrangements other and other arrangements. Clearly, um, a foreign exchange arrangement is part of a broader system, and not all fixed exchange arrangement can be sustainable unless the fundamentals aren't right. And there's something about GCC countries, about the sort of wealth of their savings and the sort of positive terms of trade shock that they had in the past years that made those pegs sustainable. On the other hand, the countries that uh, were in different arrangement and might move towards flexibilization were in situations with pre-existing vulnerabilities. So to me, the 
foreign exchange system is more of a symptom uh, rather than a direct cause. And it's something that reflects the more complex fundamentals uh, that you see behind in the economy. But now let me go back to what has been a passion for me uh, for a lifetime. So uh, you ask about why these long terms for even a temporary shock. Let me sort of walk back a second to a concept that I put forth without even uh, defining it, which is human capital. And I think it's kind of intuitive. It's kind of like the sort of health and um, knowledge that is embedded into us. And something that I wanted to bring to you is that this um, definition of human capital dates back all the way to Adam Smith. And I'm right, I'm reading directly the quote from The Wealth of Nation. The acquisition of talents during education, study or, study or apprenticeship costs a real expense. And this is the part of the how important it is to invest in human capital, something that uh, Farid was uh, alluding to. Um, and it is a real capital in a person. Those talents are part of his fortune and likewise that of society. So there is an individual dimension to human capital and there is a societal dimension of human capital. Now, the point that we make in the report is that um, well, it's twofold. First of all, that shocks can affect the accumulation of human capital. And second, that uh, the sort of prenatal and early years are fundamental. And this is a little bit how the literature is uh, partitioned writ large. So uh, we have simulations for how increasing prices while in utero can affect uh, stunting, schooling, and uh, uh, health school uh, tests. So that fetal origin is uh, something that has been put forth by the medical literature starting from the 50s, indicating that the time in utero for a child is a critical time for the development later on. And so what uh, this medical literature would then has been sort of adopted and expanded by the economic literature shows that uh, children that uh, were not in optimal conditions in utero, uh, then ha have worse health outcomes while children. And then there might be a long latency period, but even in adulthood, they end up having, um, suffer more from obesity, di diabetes, and cardi cardiovascular uh, issues uh, as, uh, as they grow. The second related stream is the one that looks at early childhood. And these are the first 1,000 days literature that looks at how nutrition and cognitive stimulation interact to help the building of neural pathways in the brain. And neural pathways in the brain are then fundamental for cognitive development, also for social emotional development, and for productivity later on. And something that we have done in the Human Capital Index is really to use this literature and condense it into a single measure that becomes a measure of the future productivity of a child born today in a country as a worker uh, later on. What we focused in this report was how shocks can affect this process of accumulation. And there the literature also sort of bifurcates and looks at either like very large shocks. And we had one of those very recently, the pandemic. And so I see a slew of papers coming out on what did the lockdown, what was the lockdown impact on uh, not only schooling, but child development, cognitive stimulation, but other large shocks could be famines or conflict. And then there is a strand of the literature that looks at milder shocks, of which I would say food inflation is one of them. And so it could be nutritional shocks, maternal stress, or also weather and climate change. And we see how these different literatures, the medical one, the environmental one, and the health and human capital one, come together to make sense of how human capital develops. So for those of you who are interested in sort of learning more, there are excellent articles and uh, Doug Allman and Janet Curry are some of the lead contributors uh, to this literature. So I really would uh, invite you to um, read more and also maybe take a look at the Human Capital Index and how we thought through how the pandemic has affected human capital. And we even have a recent um, report that really look at how collapse and recovery has shaped through the pandemic for human capital. So thank you for that question.
Thank you, Roberta. It is um, a really rich literature and something that we're still trying to understand as the impact of the pandemic and, of course, anticipating future shocks, as you said, about climate, um, about conflict, you know, how do we measure and then prepare? And that leads me to um, want to ask Farid Belhaj, when you're thinking about the work of the bank for the region, um, you know, why or why should we or how do you decide to focus on these sort of long-term impacts of food insecurity when we do have these immediate, you know, pressing sort of needs, concerns about economic growth, this kind of global slowdown, uh, inflationary pressures, what that does also for debt service. It's sort of picking and choosing, you know, where you spend your own resources. Um, so why should we focus on, as Roberta describes, these long-term impacts of maybe a short cycle, in, uh, you know, shock of this food insecurity? Yes, maybe because uh, uh, we have the, uh, how should I put it, uh, uh, sh sh shall we say arrogance of thinking that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, we can do short and medium and long term. And if we don't do that, actually, we will be uh, found in, uh, no, in dereliction of duty. Uh, what we have been doing in MENA, as I mentioned earlier, throughout the years, and notably, uh, over the last, let's say, 15 years, um, is basically to make sure that any time there is an emergency, we are there. You know, we did it when it came to the uh, impact of the Syria crisis on Lebanon and Jordan. We engaged very fast. When it, when it came to you know, helping the government of Iraq uh, in 2014, uh, when you know, they had to deal with this triple whammy of, uh, of, uh, of uh, oil prices going down and, uh, and, and ISIS and... and and uh, the whole very difficult uh, you know, discussion with, uh, with Kurdistan, we were there. Uh, and you know, when it came to, to, to the whole Arab Spring uh, and some of the countries that were in a, in a very, very uh, a difficult state of affairs, we were there. So this is to deal with the immediacy, but we would not be rendering a, a service to our you know, countries in the region if we don't look at the structural uh, 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 weaknesses that we see in, in frankly, almost all of the economies in our in our in our region. You know, uh, Karen, I, I, I guess you know we had that conversation a few you know maybe a few a few months back. If I look at MENA today, talking about human capital, you know, I look at a a a, a, um, a region uh, where there is a youth bulge. Enormous youth bulge, you know, the numbers that, you know, we've been putting on the table for years now, you know, by 2050, 300 million young people will be knocking at the door of the job market in the Middle East and North Africa. It is huge. It is huge in terms of a challenge, but also very, very much in terms of an opportunity. We all know that there will be no way to absorb this tremendous energy if we do not open the door to more private sector engagement to more uh, entrepreneurship, to allow the creat creativity of these young people to find its way into you know, more uh, uh, pro productive purposes, because the public sector is not going to be helping at that level. So this is something that we are looking at very carefully and looking at the type of reforms that we are engaging in, you know, all of them go into the, in, in the, that same di direction, helping the human capital of MENA, you know, to be translated into actual economic growth, and uh, and this is again something that we will never be able to do, you know, by ourselves. That's why having strong partnerships with you know like-minded organizations, the Islamic Development Bank being being one of them, uh, is absolutely crucial. So longer term is fundamental, but we should not. Forget that you know we also need to deal with the uh, 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 you know, what somebody way more famous than me said one day the fierce urgency of now. This is something that we need also to look at. So this is a two pronged approach that we we will, we will keep pushing as we move forward. Thank you, Farid. And maybe I'll give the last word then to um, Dr. Al Jassa from the Islamic Development Bank. This report was in partnership uh, between the World Bank and the Islamic Development Bank. And maybe just a couple of words on your sort of long term thinking about um, facing insecurity and counterbalancing it in the region. Oh, you're muted, Dr. Al Jassa. 
sorry for that. Uh, I just want to uh, 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 just confirm what Roberta also said. When I talk about a fixed exchange rate, I talk about a credible, sustainable one. I don't talk about uh, others that are just uh, choices of convenience. No, these are choices of deliberation and uh, and uh, uh, long-term uh, planning with the rest of the macroeconomic policies. We in the Islamic Development Bank have been very concerned about the events that happened over the last couple of years. I mean, first it was the COVID, and then we've had the the uh, food prices uh, emanating from the conflict in the Ukraine, and then of course. We have the climate issues becoming very serious. And we have uh, embarked upon uh, uh, putting packages or programs to deal with, with these issues. So we had one about a $4.5 billion package for to deal with the COVID. We had a $10.5 billion package to deal with the, with the food crisis. And we had about a $13 billion package to deal with the climate issues uh, and how to ameliorate uh, the uh, climate uh, difficulties that are facing our member countries. The important thing here on the food, because we're dealing with the food here, is that one third of that amount is going to go and finance short-term concerns, like building up stocks of grains and, and fertilizers. But the other two thirds are really there to invest in long-term farm that will enable the population, the areas, to depend on themselves, to produce enough food for them, and hopefully then for the urban areas uh, after that. This is very important. One of the major mistakes that have been made in the past is that we neglected agriculture. We paid all the attention to industrialization, and we forgot that we have to feed people before they can become industrial or become anything else. So that is really where we in the Islamic Development Bank are focusing on, and we have already committed more than out of the out of the 10.5 billion we have already committed more than 1.7 billion and the rest is is under consideration and we hope that the uh, membership uh, also in collaboration with the world bank and other institutions that we will uh, bring about real change in the way we deal with farming and food production and food distribution in the member countries. I think we may have to pause there. We have run out of time and it looks like um, we have had such a good discussion, lots more to continue, I think. But I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists for these excellent insights into both the economic trajectory of the MENA region, uh, plus these devastating and long-term impacts of food price inflation, uh, particularly on young people. So thank you to our audience for joining uh, the broadcast. You can read the full report by going to uh, the World Bank's website, www.worldbank.org backslash MENA. So thank you all and uh, have a good afternoon, good evening. <laughs>